Hello and welcome to this Astranti Bite Size video. Today we're going to look at a really important management tool and that's Ansos Matrix. This is a topic, this is a bit of information that's going to be relevant to you no matter what level of SEMA you are studying from. And in fact, I'm going to show it to you by showing you an extract of one of our tuition videos. Now, we have tuition videos for every single element of the SEMA syllabus. So if you like what you see, if you like what you hear, then be sure to check them out on our Astranti website. But today's video is going to be an overview to Ansoft's matrix. So my help to give you an idea of who Igor Ansoff actually was and what he actually did. Well, really, we're not going to go through his whole life, but we're going to go back to 1957 because it was in that year that Ansoff left the RAND Corporation where he'd been working as a mathematician and moved to Lockheed Aircraft Corporation. Now, this personal decision of Igor Ansoff changed the face of corporate strategy forever. That's how important Ansoff's matrix is. Because whilst at Lockheed, his attention was focused and turned to the problem of managing organisations when that environment is continually changing. And in fact, it's this kind of idea that became central to the focus of his attention towards his work in corporate strategy, which was eventually published, sorry, in 1965. Now, the most important part of this work was based on the realization of Ansoff that organizations tend to grow in two key directions. Firstly, they expand from their current products to new products as they grow. So let's have a real world example for a moment and think about Apple. Well, they originally began life as a business that manufactured computers. Then they grew and started producing the iPod. Then they grew and started producing the iPad. Then they grew and the iPhone, and the iTunes, etc., etc. I think iPhone and iPad was the other way around. But another point that Ansoff noticed was that companies grow a different way. They grow by expanding into new markets. And by market, we mean a new customer group. So if we think about Apple again, in the 1990s, their computers were most widely known for graphics and media production. And graphics specialists were really the large part of their market. But now you could say they rule the world because they've penetrated worldwide markets of almost all types of demographics from young users to old users from another demographics of customers to businesses now what Ansoff did was to bring those two points together to create his matrix which as we've stressed is now a major tool that is used throughout the business worldwide and basically it's helping companies to examine their strategic options and evaluate the risk and we're going to look at both of these points in this section but we'll we'll only touch on risk initially and then we'll come back and talk to it later we're firstly going to focus mainly on the strategic options examining the strategic options but let's bring up the matrix first and you can see along the top we've got existing markets and new markets remember we talked about or what Ansoff noting that organizations grow by moving in to new markets. And down the left hand side, we've got existing products and we've got new products. And we also mentioned, didn't we, the first way that Ansoff noted that an organization grows is through by expanding its products. We had Apple start off with computers and eventually have ended up with their iPads. Down the right hand side and along the bottom, we've got risk. And as I said, we're going to touch on risk, but something we're going to come back to. And the idea is, as you get down to the bottom right hand corner of this matrix, it's a riskier decision for the NC. But we'll come back to that. So what we've got here in this Ansoff's matrix in now is four rectangles. And each rectangle is a different strategy for growth. So in the existing markets, in the existing products rectangle, we've got a term called market penetration. Along the right hand side, so we've got existing products, so companies still carry on selling the same products, but they're beginning to operate in new markets. That's how they're growing as an organization. In the bottom left hand corner, we've got organizations operating in the same markets, but beginning to offer new products. And in the bottom right hand corner, we've got diversification, which is a growth strategy where an organization offers new products to new markets. 
So let's go into these in more detail. We're going to begin with market penetration, the least riskiest of all strategies. And this is when the organization is attempting to grow by offering existing products in their existing market segments. And so the aim behind this strategy is to increase this market share, perhaps through reducing prices, perhaps through advertising, or perhaps just finally tweaking the product. But the main aim is to get more sales. Now, if the market that the entity is operating in is growing, then simply maintaining their market share means that the organization itself is growing. But the problem is for market penetration is that there are limits. Because once market saturation approaches, another strategy has to be sought so that the entity can continue to grow. Now there are a number of ways that an entity can achieve market penetration. We're going to put a few of these on screen first. The first we've got is pricing deals and promotion. So basically we're looking at altering the pricing structure. So perhaps you would be offering short pricing deals or perhaps like you see in supermarkets, buy one, get one free, some multiple purchase deals. Another way as we briefly mentioned is through advertising. Perhaps the entity would pursue an aggressive form of advertising or perhaps they just offer a comprehensive advertising campaign. They would also look to increase their sales resources. So that might mean increase their actual sales force or the amount of outlets they have so consumers can come in and purchase their products. Another strategy that could be considered in market penetration is through acquisition, through buying a rival. Now, of course, this has the distinctive advantage of reducing the competition in the market, but it also increases distribution and availability of all the sales outlets are maintained. Now, buying a competitor is also known as horizontal integration. And what you get with horizontal integration is an incredibly quick increase in market share. And of course, as we said, the advantage of having less competition. So let's have some real world example. And it's one we used right at the beginning of the video. Now, Netflix originally began streaming videos in 2007. Now, they penetrated the market and they did this using advertising and promotion, which is one or which actually two of the techniques that we've listed in white above. And they quickly became the US market leader in this new technology. Now, six years later in 2013, they had 30 million users in the US, which represented 75% of their worldwide customer base. So we can see there, market penetration has worked for Netflix. But as we mentioned, video streaming was a growing industry at this time. So even if they just kept up their market share, they would have increased. It would have been a growth strategy. Okay, so there we go. That's market penetration. We now have got market development, which as we can see on the matrix is offering existing products, but finding new markets to do that in. Now, it's a higher risk strategy than we saw with market penetration because the company might not be as aware or they might not understand the new markets as well as they did the original market. But of course, they still do have a really good understanding of their product because the product's not changing. So what we're looking at here is just techniques really to sell in more places. So firstly, one of the new markets could be identifying new geographical markets. So perhaps an entity could start exporting to other countries or perhaps they might just be expanding their market from the location of the country that they already operate in. Another technique could be offering new distribution outlets. So for example, an entity could perhaps start selling online, maybe through eBay or through Amazon or their own website, or they'd become mail order or franchise. It's just same product, finding a new place to sell it. And of course it doesn't have to be a place. An entity could also offer their existing products to new demographic markets. So let's have an example. Let's imagine we are selling paints and we sell a huge quantity of paints 
to the industry well how about we simply repackage our paints into smaller pots and suddenly we can start selling our existing product nothing's changed to the product but we can sell it to home users and another technique could be to use alternative pricing policies just so we could appeal to new customer bases perhaps for example we could offer bulk purchasing discounts again we're just looking for ways to access new markets so let's return to our Netflix example we knew didn't we that Netflix began in the US but of course they didn't just stop with the US they began to expand internationally and by 2016 as you can see on the screen in front of you they operated in 190 countries now that is how to execute market development so there we go that's the second of our four growth strategies taken from Ansoft's matrix our third strategy is product development now as we can guess by the title and as we can see on the matrix we just go back product development is offering a new product but to a market that's already existing for that entity now it doesn't necessarily have to be a new product it could be a modified product of some kind but they're still trying to sell it to their current market now the risk here now we're going to come back to risk but just to touch on it briefly the risk is higher than for market penetration because the product that's being developed is as yet untried but of course they do understand the market so perhaps that will reduce that risk in some way now product development is about selling more products and it can be achieved in a number of ways firstly the entity can create its own R&D department so they can spot needs in their existing markets and then create the products from that need they could also rebrand someone else's product and then just sell that into their existing market because remember they've got the contacts or they could just simply purchase the rights to a product and sell another company's product for them again because they have the strength of knowing that particular market so if we return to Netflix we know from our introduction to the video that their initial product offering was DVD rental via mail order and it was only in 2007 that on-demand streaming was actually created as a new product now their customer base though was similar and customers that were familiar with the Netflix's original product were a really useful initial market for Netflix to help penetrate the streaming video market the tech delivering this new product was quite different though and required new skills and new resources now we know that Netflix enjoyed great success and after this initial success with on-demand streaming video they then continued to develop their product because they moved into commissioning their own exclusive video content such as the famous series House of Cards now again this was a high cost risky strategy and they were competing against established TV stations for this production of new content but House of Cards success especially meant that new customers signed up for their service because they could now offer exclusive exclusivity pardon me of key content once again a masterclass in product development from Netflix so our last spot on the grid is diversification developing new products for new markets now diversification itself although we said it's the last of the growth strategies itself can take multiple forms and as the risk alongside the matrix showed us it is the riskiest of the four strategies but this risk can be compensated by a high rate of return now it's risky especially because it's not just a new product it's a new market now it's not just a high rate of return it could be a possible advantage for diversification it's also the opportunity to gain a foothold in an attractive industry and reducing the overall business risk because the entity is certainly not dependent on just one industry because of course they've got a new product they've got a new market to operate in so if their initial industry has a severe problem maybe it's not growing very quickly the entity can always rely on this new industry 
But as we said, it can take multiple forms. The first is related or vertical diversification. And now it's called related because it's diversification into products and markets which are new, but are in some way related to the existing products and markets which the organization already operates. Now, the most common of instances of related diversification is through vertical integration, which is to the extent that an entity owns its upstream suppliers and its downstream buyers. And this is why it can be called related or vertical diversification. Now, expansion of activities downstream is referred to as forward integration and expansion upstream is referred to as, that's right, backward integration. So to give you an idea, this would be similar to if Netflix was to purchase one of their production companies that produces content for them. Because now they own their supplier, they can have control of the supplier, they can have control over what content is being produced for their broadcast. And that would be an example of backward integration because it's going upstream. And if we think about Netflix having more control over its inputs to create a better service. In fact, it can now use these inputs and its control over the inputs to differentiate itself from other video providers. And that is a benefit of related diversification. But that is not the only benefit, so let's have a look at a few more. Well, it improves the supply chain coordination, for example, the delivery time of components. It also catches the downstream profit margins because they know they have a guaranteed customer themselves. It also increases the entry barriers for potential rivals to enter the markets because, for example, an organization could gain sole access to scarce resources. So let's think, for example, if Netflix are buying up lots of production companies, it makes it far harder for new streaming services to get hold of content because Netflix owns the content they're not going to license it for other for their rivals are they and it also reduces the supplier power talking about Porter again there aren't we it's popping up all over the place and the disadvantages are capacity balancing issues so let's give you an example to tell you exactly what I mean by that the firm may have to build more capacity to, in an acquired business to make sure sufficient supply is available. Now, let's give you an example. Let's imagine that Netflix had previously used five production companies. Now, they've purchased one of them. Well, that one possibly will have to expand to meet Netflix's needs so that Netflix themselves don't have to keep using more production companies. So this is the balancing issues for capacity. There's also the possibility of lack of supplier competition. Now, what this could mean is that there'll be higher costs long term because, of course, if lots of suppliers are competing with each other for business, this helps drive down costs for customers. Now, of course, if there's lack of suppliers, this doesn't happen. Another disadvantage could be increased operating gearing. And this is because variable costs are converted into fixed costs or overheads. Now, let's give you an example for using Netflix again. If their production company was external, then Netflix costs are reduced if they decide, hey, no, we don't want to commission any new shows. But if the production company is in-house, then the costs of that production company have to be met whatever the output. And so this increases the risk. It also means, and this is the disadvantage to diversification, related diversification, that large amounts of capital investment are needed because, of course, large amounts of capital are needed to make acquisitions. And it also reduces the flexibility for an entity to choose their suppliers because, of course, the organization is now really heavily invested in using their vertically integrated source of supply. And the last disadvantage, there seems quite a lot of them, doesn't there, is that new manager managerial requirements will be needed because, of course, suddenly these new industry has been brought in-house well does the current managerial team have the skill set to manage them if we think about netflix 
originally the managers only had to worry about video streaming but now suddenly they've got to manage a content production company too so there we go that's diversification specifically related or vertical diversification and i say specifically because we're moving on now to unrelated or conglomerate diversification now if we can understand the link of the name related diversification to actually what it is then i'm sure we can take a wild guess at what unrelated diversification is can't we because it's when companies expand into products and markets that are unrelated to their existing operations now as you can imagine this is the riskiest of all the strategies because of course they don't know about the products and they don't know or they don't have an experience about the markets either so let's give you an example to support this idea we'll use Netflix again but let's imagine that Netflix had bought a VR gaming company a virtual reality gaming company now this would be a conglomerate acquisition because it's totally unrelated to what Netflix do at the moment they would actually be just gambling on VR becoming the next big thing which is a huge risk but one they may take if they really think that this is the future of gaming now there is precedent for this Facebook who are a social media company as we're all aware purchased Oculus Rift which is a VR headset company because they saw huge potential in that market even though there was a lot of market uncertainty at the time so there we go that's unrelated conglomerate diversification, the highest risk. So there we go. I hope you found today's video really interesting and enjoyable. If you like what you see, if you like more of these bite-sized videos, be sure to like this video as well as our YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And again, like I said at the beginning of this video, if you like these tuition videos, make sure you check out our full range on the Estranti website. And good luck with your exams.